Hey guys, welcome back to the Vintage Television Alignment Tutorial Series. In this installment, we are finally going to be actually performing an alignment, in particular video IF alignment on this 1949 Admiral 20B1 chassis. All right, let's see what kind of trouble we can get into. Here are the alignment instructions for this chassis. Now, steps one through three are for audio as our steps eight and nine. So we are just going to be doing steps four through seven. First column is the frequency we want to set our signal generator to. Our VTVM is in the same place for all of these, which is right here. Pin four of the six AC7, that is the grid. Going through a 10K resistor to our scope or VTVM or DMM and a 330 picofarad cap there to filter out any high frequency components. Okay, test connections and instructions. While peaking, keep reducing signal generator output so VTVM rating is approximately minus 1 volt DC. And we are going to be peaking these coils. The double asterisk. That is telling you that in the various production runs for this chassis, they changed the location of some of these coils. I already know that we are going to be using this topmost section. So this chart, which you're going to find in any detailed service info, is going to show you all the coils. And this, this one's especially nice because they tell you A9, 22.3 max. A1, 21.25 min, A8, 22 max. These are the ones we're going to be adjusting. A6, A7, A8, A9, all the ones that say max. So 22, 3, 22, 25, 3, and 23, 5. The first one we're going to do is 23, 5, A7, and A7 is that guy right there. This is the top view of the chassis looking down. So that is right between a 6AU6 and 6AL5 over in this area and my alignment tool plastic tube metal bit at the end which will lock into the shaft on the movable slug so first off you know, I've never actually used this generator to do anything like this before so let's see range I'm on the wrong range This, this the getting to the top range of this device here. Okay, so we want 235, which is right there. 20, or sorry, 25.3. Well, I double check that. It's 25 do, 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 right there. And notice my meter is pegged, because I wasn't paying attention to it while adjusting this. I have too much output. But that's good. We know that this our setup is working. An easy way to check that is take your shield, take it off the tube, and move it away. Huh, the meter is still pegged. That might be putting out so much RF. I am. <laughs> Even though I took this off, it's still just radiating out everywhere. Now, if things are working right, when you put this over the tube... It goes up. Boy, this thing can really, this thing has a lot of output strength. <laughs> you can probably transmit over a short distance with this thing. All right, so we want a little more output level than that. Let's see if the fine. I'm on the 1.5 volt scale on my VTVM, so we want about 1 volt, which is right about there. So I'm going to go up a little higher and the variable and dial us in. There we are, right about on 1.0. Now I'm going to use my alignment tool and go over and adjust it. I'll give you a close-up of that. These are what the adjustable slugs look like on this set. It's a threaded brass shaft. At the other end of this is a iron, powdered iron slug going down the center of a coil. You lock this over the end of it. There's a notch cut in the end of this and this has a bit of metal that'll bite into it and you rotate it. 
It's one reason I like these early sets. I like the design, I like the engineering, and in particular these, these coils. I've never had any trouble with them in terms of seizing or the core getting stuck inside or these threads getting worn out. They've always just worked. You might find them where they have a little bit of Loctite or something on here to keep these from moving after they were adjusted at the factory. Just a little rocking on that should break it loose and you can rotate it. Later sets, things got a lot different. To lower cost, to um, shrink things, to make them smaller. They went with a plastic tube with uh, internal threading and the slug itself was also threaded and it would be going down through the center and the, the slug itself would have a, a sort of notch molded into it and you'd use something like this end of it to lock into that and rotate. Over time the plastic shrinks, expands, distorts and that slug can very easily get frozen inside and when you go to adjust it they can shatter. That's when we're, we're talking about getting into the late 50s when I started using those. They're definitely in the 60s and 70s. I would really, really think hard before attempting to adjust one of those. Unless you've done everything else and you know that there's a problem with the alignment, I would not attempt it. And if you do, go very gingerly. I've seen so many horror stories where the cores break, shatter, uh, too much force is used and the whole form moves and snaps a little fine wires inside. You will not have that kind of trouble with these coils. Okay, let's get in there and adjust A6 for a maximum. It's this guy right here. Lock my tool on the slug. And start out by rocking it back and forth, clockwise, counterclockwise, to get some idea where you're at. And up, 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 and now we're going down. That's what you want to see. That's how you know that your circuit is working properly. It should have a definite peak where it rolls off on either side. And we're back and forth until we're dead on. Now, unless you've had to do repairs in the IF or you know it's been monkeyed with, shouldn't be too far off. In this case it wasn't. And we'll go through and repeat that for the other three coils. That's it. That's it for the video IF alignment on most early black and white TVs. It's not complicated. No sleep gen, no scope. Most service shops didn't have that kind of fancy exotic stuff. So they kept the alignment procedure simple. Yes, you can use a sleep gen. For the final step, we will. They say if you have one, hook it up to check the overall response. But while peaking each stage, doing it visually is actually rather difficult on these sets. Go through and do the procedure as they outlined it. Now let's suppose you don't have a VTVM and don't want to run out and buy one, but you do have a multimeter. Well, let's do it with that. So I have this hooked up to the same spot. We have minus 0.822 volts. And this particular meter also has a little bar on the bottom, which can be helpful. Let's see what happens with that reading as I adjust that A6 coil again. Yeah, the numbers jump around. The bar graph is also moving, but doesn't have the greatest resolution. I think in this case we'd be better off looking at the numbers. No, it's not as nice as seeing a needle swing around on a nice big meter face. But we can, we can do it with this as well. So there I pass the peak. I'll go back. So it looks like about minus 835 is our peak. right about there. So you don't have to use a VTVM or an analog meter. Uh, next up I'll show you how you can use a tiny SA for your RF generator. 
Now let's try using the Tiny SA for an RF generator. I just picked this up a few days ago. I barely know how to use it, but uh, I do believe it can generate radio frequencies. This is a little mini pocket beginner spectrum analyzer. Well, one of the modes is switch to low out. That means it will output frequency from the low jack. That's the lower frequency band, which is what we want. Uh, the interface is kind of goofy for a level and frequency where you can kind of tap or slide along here to change it. But you can also just bring up this keypad. So we can say, put in 25 megahertz. We want no modulation, no sweep, and turn it on. And now it's outputting 25 megahertz from this connector. So now it's a matter of how do we feed this into the TV. What you get with it, you get a couple cables and you get a whip antenna. You don't get an SMA to alligator clip or BNC. Uh, such things are available on the market, but they don't come with the kit. Uh, but assuming we can rig this up to that tube shield, this should work. Yeah, sure enough, this does work. I put an alligator clip on the outside collar here, which should be ground going to the chassis. And when I take this uh, output antenna here, there, near the tube shield, or touch it to that tube shield, yeah, pegging my meter there. So make sure you drop that output level down a little bit. Not too far. Okay. And, uh, let me tweak A6 again to make sure this is actually working. Yeah. Very cool. So there you go. Uh, moving on now to A7, which is a slug between the last 6AU6 and the 6AL5 towards the side of the chassis. 23.5 megahertz, and we want to peak for this guy. Ooh, wow, that was way off. Nope. I'm going to go over and decrease my signal generator. Now I'm using a fancy schmancy RF generator. You certainly do not need to. Uh, for a while I had an HP, uh, was I think 606 up here on the workbench. Uh, that would be more than adequate. But even like a, a Heath kit, uh, I forget what it's called, but um, there are plenty of basic entry level RF generators that would be just fine. Let's say we don't even need a, we don't need any modulation, nothing fancy, just as long as you can dial in an a frequency fairly accurately and adjust the output level such that you're not pegging your meter. Believe it or not, we're done. That's it for doing the video IF. We peaked four coils and that's that. We still need to do the sound, which we'll do later. Now what about all this equipment I've been talking about? Sleep generators, marker generators, XY displays. Yeah, we're going to do that now to verify that what we did was correct. But it's been my experience, if you go through the, the described steps and the coils peak like they should, meaning they have a definite peak and it falls off on either side, you're going to get a really good picture. It is nice to, to see the visual response curve and reassure yourself that, yeah, I got it right. And maybe it'll be off a little bit. In which case, sure. Uh, maybe try tweaking each one a little bit to see if you can get it closer, but you can get lost in the weeds really quick to where you start tweaking those coils visually and you can't get the response curve to look like what you want and it keeps getting worse and worse. And you end up having to start over and go through the peaking steps again. 
I know that because I've had to do it a bunch of times myself. So generally the visual stuff, I think it's interesting, but I don't recommend trying to do the alignment visually, not on sets like this. Okay, now what you've all been waiting for, sweep generator time. Connections are mostly as they were before. We still have minus 4.5 volts on the AGC bus. We're still feeding a signal in through the tube shield. We're still taking our output from that RC network, but the difference now is where the signals are coming from and going to. RF out is not coming from my 1080 sweep generator going to that tube shield. The output of the TV is going to the D-mod input. I'm not using a special demodulator probe like this, which has a crystal diode in it. We don't need it because our TV is our detector. We're just checking basically DC voltage levels as we sweep the frequencies. So it's already been demodulated. So this is just a straight uh, coax to alligator clips. Vertical and horizontal are going to the vertical and horizontal on my XY monitor. And external marker input is going to my RF generator. When you first turn on it defaults to full sweep, which is the full 1 megahertz to 1000 megahertz. We don't want that. So you push this little button to go to delta F. Now it'll be centered around this frequency. We have a course adjust here. And we have a fine adjust to the left of that. So we want about 25 megahertz. And sweep width. This rotary switch goes 0 to 9. We want a very small sweep width, 10 megahertz about. And this is our variable. And in our output level we have coarse and we have fine. Adjust it just like with the um, RF generator such that you can get a decent indication on your display but you don't overload the amp. And this is what we get. Now it is supposed to look like this. So a few things. One, depending on your equipment and your setup, your response may go positive, it may go negative. I can switch this around at my leisure, so do it like they have it. So <laughs> the larger response is going down now. What I can't do though is they, their frequency increases right to left. Mine goes left to right. So use your imagination. They show 21.25 is the sound marker. That would be about here. That's a trap. We don't want any sound info. That's that FM sound carrier to leak into our video. So they have a trap there. So it should be zero or as close to it as you can get it to be. And as far as the lumps go, we should have one lump at a little greater than 22 and the other 25.3 and the depression in the middle 23.5. So we should have about 22 megahertz here, about 23.5 here, and around 25.3 here. How do we do that? What frequency? So our axis here is frequency and this is amplitude. What are the frequencies along here? That's where the marker generator comes in. This has built-in markers. I'll turn them on and increase the size. So this, 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 these are all 1 megahertz increments. So say this is 20, that'd be 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, something like that. I want better. I want more control than that. So I'm going to turn off the markers that are built in to the 1080 and hey we still have a squiggle here where is that coming from that's coming from my rf generator i have it set right now to 25.75 and that is feeding into my 1080 and that's right about where it should be 25.75 should be about halfway between this and this this little uh dip here should be 23.5 i'll dial that in 23.5 pretty close pretty close and we should have but this should be about 22 and it's kind of there so one problem with markers is when they're on a steep 
uh, slope they get kind of spread out <laughs> 22 is somewheres in here so we're we're very good we're very close to what it should be let's talk about markers for a moment I just set up my external marker to be 25 megahertz and I put this nice little blip here that's really really crucial to be able to do an alignment with a sweep generator is you need to know at key frequencies what is the response there are two distinct ways to do it the old school way to do it is to take an RF generator and take the output and just lay it near your other your sweep generator RF so like near this tube shield the idea being that as I'm sweeping say 20 to 30 megahertz and I have my generator set at 25 when they both hit 25 or get close to 25 they're gonna start mixing and enter and you'll get a difference and a sum that's what that little blip is that is the two getting close together and causing ripples the problem with doing it that way is you are messing with the input to your TV or your amplifier. You're adding in an extra signal to the input. It's going to have a subtle effect on the frequency response of it. A much nicer way to do it is post marker injection, which is what this setup is. Notice the output of my TV is not going directly to my display. It could. I could take the output of the TV and go right to the vertical on that, or my scope. It's not. It's going back to the sweep generator. And my marker frequency is going to the sweep generator. What this device is doing is it's adding in a blip, a marker, after it's already gone through the TV and the TV has done its thing. So this will not be interfering with the IF response. So that's cool. Um, we got plenty close. Uh, trust me, having done this a bunch of times, this is really good. Uh, so a few key things. So we have that sound trap at 21.25. You want that, to, or whatever your sound IF frequency is. You don't want sound going into the video. You want to have this bandwidth be uh, as wide as is indicated and yeah this is a consequence of their design choices it's not perfectly flat in a perfect world yes this would be completely flat across it's not that is not much of a difference you would never notice it on your screen so that that's good uh, and then it should level off but another key thing is the slope of these Remember I talked about that uh, vestigial sideband? That's why this is at kind of a 45 degree angle and this is much steeper. This is where that vestigial sideband comes into play. And that's why it's key to get the 25.75 about halfway through there, and we do. So uh, we're looking really good. We're looking really good. Uh, good enough, I'm, I'm calling this done. So that is the process of doing the video IF alignment on a stagger tuned set. Hook up your equipment as indicated. Peak the various stages at the free key frequencies indicated. And if you have the equipment, check the overall response, tweak a little bit if needed. I'll, I'll show you in, uh, how that looks. So they mention, hey, if your 2575 is not close to being at the halfway point they say go to I think it's a7 and tweak it a quarter turn in either direction and see if you can get it to be closer so here I'm tweaking a7 and I'm barely turning it it's just just uh, 10 degrees in either direction and has a profound effect that's why you lose your mind if you try doing this completely visually without any sort of guide is just touch to barely tweaking these or if you're just doing it blind and you just want to start poking around in a tv you just barely touch those coils it has a profound impact on the if response but if you needed to you could go in there and touch it up a little bit in this case i didn't need to and part of that or a big part of that is because i have nice equipment and i had a fresh set of tubes in the set and it's already been fully restored all that stuff helps so that's gonna be it for uh, the visual alignment on this set next up we'll do the sound and we'll do the tuner
happy as always. If you have any thoughts or comments or feedback, please leave a comment. And thanks for watching.